Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I think it's really fitting that we're here having this conversation in New Orleans because the people of New Orleans have been fighting for racial justice for most of the city's 300 years. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I learned early growing up here in Gentilly and New Orleans East was the story of Plessy versus Ferguson mm -hmm. and how that case was born out of local black resistance to Jim Crow laws in the 1800s. Now, Mr. Plessy was not successful in that case, but black resistance to Jim Crow laws in the 1800s. That's something. And here we are today in one of the most diverse cities in the country, with activists still struggling for access to basic things like education, legal representation, jobs, housing. There have been some victories, and that's what we're going to start talking about. I want to turn to Norris, and I'm hoping you can tell us about your personal journey and what led you to found Voice of the Experienced. Uh, good morning, first of all. Uh, the thing that led me to founding this organization is kind of, matter of fact, Sunday would be the 15-year anniversary mm -hmm. of it. Saturday would be the 16-year anniversary of me being released from prison. So I spent 27 years, 10 months, and 18 days in prison. And while there, um, this country was, the prison systems in this country were exploding. They were having rides all over the country. And a group of guys kind of like got together and said, well, we can change our conditions or we can fight to change our circumstances. And, you know, the, we went out with the ladder because we realized that we set the place on fire. All we was going to be doing was sleeping somewhere else inside the prison boundaries. And so we started with a group called Angola Special Civics Project. And through that, we started researching uh, what were the policies in 10 states across this country? And we realized that in every instance, Louisiana was the most repressive of all of them. I mean, from the type of sentences that folks were receiving, how folks actually were being punished, and that every time that the United States Supreme Court made a decision that impacted our lives, Louisiana became more and more are repressive. Every time they abolish the death penalty, they change sentencing schemes uh, across the board. So it became personal for me and those guys who were inside with me to continue the fight to, to do these things. And I tell people, prison for me was a bad experience with good results because I wouldn't be doing the work I'm doing now had it not been for that bad experience. Uh, I've learned, I worked in the prison law library for over 20 years as the librarian, and it uh, gave me a wealth of knowledge about the law, how the law operates, and uh, I'm steady looking at this mind of race and justice, and you started off talking about Plessy and, you know, learning and reading all about these cases and how the Supreme Court in this country upheld a lot of the unjust laws in this country, and, you know, just last year, you know, we were able to end 135 years of Jim Crow in this state. And you would think about, man, how did it even exist? I mean... And that was a big, important change. I just want to say Louisiana joined most of the rest of the nation in requiring unanimous jury convictions. Mm -hmm. And you advocated for that. And the leading case out of Louisiana, Johnson versus Louisiana, I, I grew up under Frank Johnson. Frank Johnson grew up... Uh, two blocks from me, or I grew up two blocks from him because he was older, and seeing the, the, the court system year in and year out with this nation, 48 other states had unanimous verdicts, the whole federal system had unanimous verdicts, but the Supreme Court, for whatever reason, continually to uphold Louisiana's practice of non-unanimous jury verdicts. That's quite a victory. Uh, Denise, let's talk about mental health in the city and some of the healing work that you do. How is trauma from Katrina and so many other triggers infecting, uh, impacting individuals here and the overall psyche mm -hmm. of the city? Before we get to the acute shock that was Katrina, we have to think about the chronic adversities that existed in New Orleans and how that impacted the rescue, the ongoing recovery, and the kind of infrastructure that we have put in place to help those who survived, recovered, and are still struggling with the inequities. So for me, when I came back, 
And I hadn't intended to come back to New Orleans, but I feel this was a call-in. And I would go to the schools right after Katrina just to see what I could do. It was very organic. And I noticed that young people were so dysregulated because I'd been here before my kids went to public schools, and this was not the condition that I had seen prior. So then, at some point, um, being a psychiatrist, I said, well, I'm going to start screening young people for signs and symptoms of the tra trauma-based disorder. So post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, the kinds of exposures that they're having, their exposure to trauma and violence in their lives, and just what they worry about. And it was really very shocking and remains very shocking. At any given time in New Orleans, from our data, and we've surveyed over 6,000 kids now, 25 percent of them are endorsing signs of active post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. We now have the science that tells us how that impacts a young person's brain. So what happens as the young people are traumatized and become emotionally dysregulated? They also become behaviorally dysregulated. Young people don't have the language to tell you how they're feeling. They, they, unless you really spend a lot of time with them, and we don't yet have the infrastructure in our mental health system to address all of this. Well, my next so, question was, do you see those children ending up in the criminal justice system? Very possible. Um, a kid, you know, I had a young man that I saw, and he said on any day, given day, day going to school, he could walk by, see someone shot in the streets, he could walk by that. He goes to school, he can't concentrate, he's thinking about his word about his own safety. He might, do, he might talk back to the teacher, and depending on who gets called, he could end up in the juvenile justice system. What more could the city do to help a child like that? I think the city is doing something. I'm very proud of our current director at, for the mental health system, the public mental health system. Uh, we've been working together. We were able to get a policy that before we diagnose a young child with a behavioral disorder, you know, the oppositional, um, defiant disorder, the conduct disorder that really starts channeling young people into the juvenile justice system. Now in the public mental health system, we're screening them for trauma-based disorders. So we are beginning where we probably need more workforce that's very specifically focused on how to deal with mm -hmm. trauma in young kids without diagnosing them with attention deficit disorder and putting them on drugs. Mm. Because exactly. we can treat PTSD with talking therapy with children. Yeah. Wow. Now, Mary, you've been advocating for children, in, particularly Spanish-speaking immigrants, in many different places across the country and for a very long time. What do you see in New Orleans that's different from what you've seen in other places? Um, well, this is, we are in the deep south, right? And the stronghold of slavery, the stronghold of white supremacy. And so... Um, so that is a huge difference in terms of the context in which our children go to school, uh, segregated schools, schools that are not providing a quality education. And so uh, this is sort of the first part, right? The poverty. Uh, and I think that while we have, um, particularly for immigrant children, uh, because the conversation has been so binary here in uh, Louisiana and in the South, uh, black and white, um, not understanding that uh, language ac access, language justice is a, a right that people have is, um, is something that everyday people encounter as a barrier to uh, any of the, you know, schools, uh, the health, you know, anything that they're encountering as they're uh, living, that's uh, the very first barrier that they're encountering. Now, can you tell me a little bit about what in your life experience uh, led you to, to found Our Voice, Nestor Vas? Yeah, um, so my brother, um, I come from a family of organizers, a family uh, where we uh, had to organize around my brother, my brother, my big brother, uh, had, uh, was incarcerated for 15 years. And uh, so being able, you know, while he wasn't in an ICE detention center or anything like that, he was um, 
incarcerated for 15 years and we did that time with him, we were able to, um, you know, organize around specific things that were happening, uh, specific services that he needed and that other young people needed. And so that's why uh, I started organizing and why uh, we were organized as a family and why we do the work at Our Voice No Struggles now. Mm -hmm. Now, your organization isn't specifically a criminal justice uh, organization, but uh, you intersect with the system quite a lot. Can you tell us about some of the, yeah, the issues you've had? Yeah, we in uh, started off as an education organization. Now we work on education adjacent issues. We believe that uh, obviously people don't encounter uh, issues, whether it be education, organizing world. We may call that not a primary issue, but a secondary issue. So we may not say uh, that that is the first thing that people want to organize around. And so it's really important that as organizers, we uh, really see how people live real lives, right? Which is uh, they're intersecting with all of these issues simultaneously. Mm -hmm. What are some of the specific achievements? So you've uh, won in the Orleans schools for yeah, for Spanish-speaking so children. In Orleans Parish, we were able to uh, run a campaign called It's Your Right. It's Your Right uh, looked at, it started off with uh, ICE and the fear of ICE and ICE coming into schools to detain children. Uh, and as we started to uh, talk to and organize the front office staff and organize uh, security, you know, and um, and folks who were managing the front doors, what we realized that even more so than ICE coming into schools, um, that NOPD and sheriffs and like people, you know, local police was coming into schools to talk to black children about um, the Snickers bar they stole at Walgreens the day before. And so it was really important for us to uh, pass policy that created a, um, a process for how law enforcement entered school buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've all spoken quite a bit about building bridges between advocates of different identities in the city. What would that look like to you? What, what is your vision of, of how these organizations interact with each other to achieve goals? Yeah, just uh, maybe about a month ago, maybe we held a huge uh, event called the Black and Brown Get Down. The Black and Brown Get Down, yes, was um, <laughs> an event where we brought uh, over 300 um, uh, black and brown leaders of our community to come together to talk about how do we build coalition if we're talking about winning in uh, our city that's going to require all of us and uh, for us to sort of figure out what are some of how do we start to get to know each other and start how do we start to have those really uh, intense conversations around uh, anti-blackness that exists in the Latino community, anti-immigration, right, and um, in the black community, and how do we really get to a place where we're in real relationship with each other so that we can begin to identify what are the narrow sort of ticket of issues in which we can work together. Mm -hmm. Do you all have anything to add, Norris? Uh, no, I agree, I agree, uh, because one of the things that we have realized uh, in, this, in, in organizing, that all we have is each other. And, uh, you know, for years that uh, the opposition has always drew a line in the sand between us to do everything yeah. to kind of like that's not y'all fight while y'all hanging with those folks. But uh, we have more things in common, uh, especially against an identified, uh, you know, force that's totally against black and brown people, not just in this city, but in this country. And so all of our efforts are geared towards how do we uh, help each other, keep our own self-autonomy doing what we're doing, but at the same time start building these bridges uh, across these things. And I think we have done, uh, we do a lot of work with the uh, uh, Norris Worker Center for Racial Justice, uh, with them uh, around their immigration fight, and because at one time we were those people, you know, and I tell people all the time, don't get it twisted that, uh, especially in this post-Katrina New Orleans, is that they became what we were always, the, the folks that people walked on. And when we wasn't here in the immediate aftermath of the storm, they took advantage of those folks. You know, and I tell people all the time, and you know, I'm looking at Jason sitting there, and he was on the council, when it's because of this community that most of the folks in this city were able to return because of their labor. Mm -hmm. And then once folks got kind of comfortable being within their places, 
then they became the enemy. We're done with you. We don't need you no more. And, uh, you know, that's been our history for a thousand years, that uh, long as we were servants to them, we were needed. But the minute that uh, the job was done, they moved on. And so that built a greater bond with us because we had already been there and we was able to tell that story about, hey, this is the next move they're going to make to try and undermine the work that y'all are doing. And so I, I think the strength that uh, we have, not just here in the city, but across this country with black and brown people, is that uh, we are starting to see the fruits of our labor because we are actually showing up. And we're showing up in a way that, uh, not just with lip service, but uh, we're showing up in ways where we are building power uh, in our communities. Mm -hmm. I want the audience to know that we're going to come to questions uh, from you all in just a moment. That sounded like a very positive note to me, and I'm wondering if uh, you all also feel that way, that, about optimism about the future. Um, before we get there, we have a lot of unhealed trauma mm. in our communities. When you've been stepped on, you somehow get damaged. Mm, yeah. Our bodies, our minds, our spirits. And so what I oftentimes say is that any justice work, any equity work has to deal with the trauma that we've endured. And so as we heal ourselves and we are better able to connect with each other, because when we are traumatized, we begin to see we're not sure that this person, I'm not sure you really mean right by me. Mm -hmm. And so as we are healing, yes. And my tagline is that healing is really the revolution. And as we heal ourselves and hopefully get the systems, the people support the people who are working to undo these inequitable systems, then I see the optimism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, is there someone in the audience with a question? Question for our panelists. Nope, someone's got to be curious about something. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm from the Heal and Mind and Organization that focuses on people with um, the most serious mental illnesses and, car and alternatives to incarceration, homelessness, and death. So 50% of the people in our mm -hmm. jail plus right now have some kind of psychiatric diagnosis. So I'm just wondering, in terms of all the money that's being spent, and the mental health programs that we're putting in place for people who are, say, traumatized or, or um, you know, there's other mental health initiatives going on. What, the outcomes don't seem to be changing for people with serious mental illnesses who are homeless, incarcerated, unnecessarily institutionalized in nursing homes and, and dying of suicide early um, and other comorbidities. So um, how do you see that we might be able to change the trajectory for people with the most serious mental illnesses so I'm not and I'm a mental I'm an advocate for people with serious mental mm -hmm. illnesses not a mental health advocate mental health mm -hmm. is something that we all need right mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering if any of the panelists can address that I guess I should start <laughs> um, I think we're gonna have to look at how we got there when we um, deinstitutionalized our state hospitals without having plans in the community to deal. And, you know, some of these efforts were not necessarily, now there were advocates who were saying that we needed to fix these state hospitals, but ultimately it was an issue of money and where this land was and the developers and them wanting that. So it was not just the goodness of the hearts of people to say, yeah, I think what we're going to have to do is stop seeing the jails as mental health um, facilities. We should really be more compassionate around mental health challenges. We should try. Some folks with serious mental illness do need a longer time, a longer stay. How do we make those places some place that is humane? because I know that there were problems with those hospitals in the early years. But then how do we build a very robust community mental health system that really 
addresses at multiple levels and is coordinated. And I think that is the challenge that many public mental health systems are facing. But, you know, we have to put our money where the things we believe in exist. And do we have the will, the public will, to put the resources into creating a very robust mental health system? That's the question that we as a society have to answer, not just the people who are tasked with trying to make something out of nothing. Thank you. Great question. I think we have another one over here. Yep. Hi, Adon. Troy Glover, New Orleans native. I have a two-part question. One, how do you see equity playing a role in two, shaping what the criminal justice system look like moving forward? For example, a lot of the times the stakeholders that are directly impacted by the work um, don't have a stake in changing or really reforming the work moving forward. So in each of you all's organizations, how do you use equity? Um, and I know that's like the, the big code word, but equity as a, as, a, as a means to move the work forward. And the second question is, what, what is success? Um, is the goal to reduce the jail population? Um, and for your organizations, how do you see success happening in this work when it comes to criminal justice? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you want some? Sure. Um, so I'll say that personally, um, I believe in abolishing prisons. I believe that it's not just about um, it's not just about reducing the beds. Uh, you can have no equity in a system that was meant to incarcerate black people, that was meant to incarcerate uh, brown people and poor people. And so, uh, you know, we can get to these reforms, and these re reforms are important in the sort of short-term strategy, but long-term, it is uh, deeply important for us to start to talk about these creative ways that um, Dr. Shervington was talking about. Uh, how do we restore uh, our communities? How do we restore our families? How do we, you know, uh, provide all of the services that are needed on the front end so that we're uh, not continuing to uh, build beds and build prisons? And, and, I, and I'll take the second question. I think one of the things, one example that during the campaign that we, what we view as success, was during that campaign, uh, statewide campaign, we were able to turn out a million and a half people to vote who hadn't mm -hmm. showed up in 30 years in Louisiana mm -hmm. in that way. We knocked on over 200,000 doors. Uh, we sent out over 2 million text messages. And so the success was the end result. We won with 64% of the vote to make this thing happen. We are building power inside our environment so those stakeholders that if you're not giving the folks what they want, need, and desire, oh, we're in a position now to start removing people. Uh, this last year, there's a new group of people who have been enfranchised. We were able to get the laws, cha the laws changed to enfranchise over 70,000 formerly incarcerated people in this state who, for no other reason than the fact that they went to prison, they were denied their right to vote. And so when you factor in since 1974 when our Constitution changed, over 600,000 people have been released from prison that now has a right to vote. Mm -hmm. And that can mm -hmm. play a role in changing policy in this city and in this mm -hmm. state around the things that impact them. And so I see our wins being that if people are resistant to the change that folks in our community are seeking, well, we just got to remove those people from uh, being policy makers. Because if you don't change the policy, we change the people. Mm. Great. All right. Well, I, I hope you join me in thanking our panelists. I think we'll leave it right there. Great discussion. <laughs>